Hello and welcome. This is the second episode of the South East Rivers Trust webinar series, The Story of Rivers. The South East Rivers Trust is a grassroots environmental charity working to bring rivers and their catchments back to life across the southeast of England. The Story of Rivers will share with you what makes our rivers special, why we need them, how they work and what threats and pressures they're facing, as well as sharing the most important part, what we're doing to try and help them. All of our webinars will be posted on our Facebook group, The Cert River Club, along with many other activities and content. So your presenters today are myself, Jess Mead. So I've worked for the Trust for a couple of years and I um, work with all of our wonderful volunteers at running community engagement and volunteering events. Hi there, I'm David Cornage. Uh, I've been working for Southeast Rivers Trust since January and I'm part of the delivery team. Uh, we deliver projects on the ground across our catchments. And I'm Cathy Bauer. I've been with South East Rivers Trust for one and a half years now um, and I work mainly on water resources and how we can manage our landscapes to protect and restore them. Great, so our episode today is going to be um, a tour of the South East Rivers. So um, we'll start talking about where we work and the rivers that we're lucky enough to be working in and around. And then we'll put the South East into a bit of context so that you can see um, how that fits into the wider picture. Uh, and then we will focus on three very, very different rivers. So the Cray, which is a chalk stream, the Belt, which is a clay river, and the Beverly Brook, which is a highly modified urban river. So before we get into things in too much detail, I would like to say that if you have any questions, um, either during the webinar or after, you can post them in the comments section uh, on Facebook. And this will allow us to um, inform future webinars and also run some Q&A sessions with a panel of our expert staff. Um, and that will mean we can dig a bit deeper into some of those subjects that we don't have time to cover uh, in enough detail in the, in the presentations. So where do we work? Uh, we work across 12 different river catchments from the Loddon in the west right across Kent uh, to the Stour, which is our most easterly catchment. And no two of these rivers are the same. And that, um, why is that I uh, hear you cry? Well, that basically has to do with what's below our feet and how we're managing the landscape around us. So um, we're going to start thinking about what's under our feet to start with, because the nature of a river is largely dictated by the geology of its catchment. Some areas of the southeast are chalk landscapes, and here we have thin soils, and the chalk bedrock is highly permeable, so it allows water to sink in. So when it rains, um, the water just soaks into that ground and infiltrates into the groundwater sources that Cathy talked about in the previous webinar. Because chalk is so permeable, there's very little surface runoff, and rivers are fed directly from those groundwater sources. And David will share with you how that works um, when he talks about chalk streams later on. So groundwater fed rivers tend to have a nice consistent flow uh, and because the rock um, has filtered that water it's taken out a lot of the contaminants and it tends to be very high quality clean water. Um, in clay landscapes uh, things work a little differently uh, and in these areas we have heavy soils and a bedrock that doesn't allow the water to infiltrate. And this means there's a lot more surface flow and it tends to be how rivers are fed from surface water rather than from groundwater. And because the water is traveling across the surface of the um, ground, these can pick up more impurities on the way. So things like um, hydrocarbons off the road or pesticides or sediment. And this can in negatively impact the river's uh, water quality. Um, and also because there's a more direct connection between rain falling and it entering, entering the river, um, water levels uh, in the river itself tend to rise and fall a lot more readily depending on the amount of rain we've had. So where do these um, different landscape types fit into the southeast? Well, the pink area um, is clay and you'll see that it's found under much of London. The yellow area is chalk and it forms these two bands um, which correspond to the North and the South Downs. And the green area, um, both the bright green and the lightish green nearer the coast, um, that's the Wealden group which is sandwiched between those two chalk ridges. And uh, that's more impermeable and clay-like veils. And the white area is the greensand ridge which is also a permeable rock type. So more than 40% of the region is covered by um, protected designations. So that includes green belts, sites of special scientific interest, 
areas of outstanding natural beauty uh, national parks and although there's some overlap between those different designations um, so some areas have more than one um, about a third of the region is recognised as having these national quality landscapes. So there's a great variety um, of natural habitats that we have here. Um, so chalk downland, clay vales, woodlands and heath. And actually the South East has four of the most wooded county, counties in England uh, and 40% of England's natural, uh, semi-natural ancient woodland. So as well as these uh, varied natural landscapes, we have um, over a million hectares of more managed uh, agricultural farmland, which includes production of nearly 50% of the UK's fruit. Um, the region is also the most highly populated region in the UK, uh, with really high population densities. And the area of land which is built on uh, is higher than the national average. And that could be for in industry or uh, residential areas and things like that. So you might be thinking uh, that it feels as if it's always raining here <laughs> and especially after February, I wouldn't blame you for thinking that. However, the southeast of England is actually seriously water stressed and um, with demand for clean water potentially going to be outstripping supply within the next few decades. Uh, and with an increasing population and the likely effects of climate change, um, you know, that's adding extra pressures. And here in the southeast, most of our water um, for drinking and washing and things like that, um, the, all the water that comes out of our taps um, is abstracted from groundwater sources, um, though some is taken directly from rivers. So groundwater infiltration rates in the southeast are also being affected by the changes in land use that I mentioned on the previous slide. So hard tarmac built on areas um, that has impermeable surfaces, so the water is not being um, allowed to soak into the ground. So we've got less rainfall than other parts of the UK, as you can see on this map, actually, you know, half the amount of even Sydney in Australia, which you think of as a dry place. Um, so not only that, but we want all the rain that we've got to be able to soak in to those um, permeable grounds to feed our groundwater sources. Um, but we're paving over a lot of areas and we've got more and more people moving to the region to and that will want to use that water supply. So it's a, quite a tricky balance um, between the water that we need as a population, but also leaving water in the landscape. And it's important that we all do our part at home to save water and protect this precious resource. So we're gonna talk to you now about three very different rivers um, and take you on a tour of the, the Southeast and what it has to offer. So the first we're gonna talk about is the Cray, which is a chalk stream. The Belt, which is a tributary of the River Medway, um, and also the Beverly Brook. So I'm going to hand you over now to David to talk about the River Cray. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Jess. I'm going to talk about the River Cray and chalk streams more generally. Uh, as you can see, this is a lovely, beautiful bridge called the Five Arches Bridge on Footscray Meadows, which is a, a fantastic structure, uh, but also a barrier to fish passage. So chalk streams are a globally rare habitat. Uh, there are around about 250 chalk streams that we know of in the world, uh, and about 85% of them are in England uh, and the rest are in France. Uh, they're a very important habitat, as you can see from the map in the bottom right corner. Most of these are in uh, southern England, and as, as Jess has already alluded to, this is a very populous area uh, with lots of agriculture and, and urban centres. Uh, so that means that around about three quarters of these streams are um, in a moderate, bad or poor state. Uh, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to them. Uh, but in a natural setting and more natural setting, there are some very interesting characteristics, characteristics of, of uh, chalk streams. Um, because the way that, because of the time it takes for uh, water to permeate through the, through the chalk and into the stream itself, they have a very stable uh, flow regime. Uh, this means that they're often wetted uh, throughout the year and there's Fewer, fewer peaks in the fewer peaks and troughs in their flow. Um, they have a very stable temperature, so the, the tend to have a very stable temperature of around about 10 degrees, uh, which means that the dissolved oxygen levels in the water tend to remain quite steady, uh, which is important for fish and invertebrates uh, that inhabit them. Uh, and because the water tends to permeate into the ground in the uplands of the, of the catchment. Uh, before it reaches the river, they have they tend to have smaller flood peaks in in high rainfall events, uh, which means there's lower energy in the in the catchment as a whole, in the water as a whole, uh, which makes them more um, stable in the landscape, and also affects their erosion and deposition uh, 
features. Um, and because the water is not running into the stream from the from the from the surrounding landscape as much, uh, they tend to have less silt and sand running into the into the stream, lower sediment um, levels, and in an ideal situation, less pollutants. Um, but there are a lot of nutrients in chalk streams like uh, carbonate and calcium, which makes them very productive and rich ecosystems, uh, for, and and means that it's quite a varied and uh, adapted ecology to uh, chalk streams. So as you can see from this graph, uh, so water will permeate the top of the catchment. Um, in this case, the chalk, uh, the chalk at the very top of the catchment, uh, permeate through the through the porous ground um, and join the ground out groundwater aquifer. And slowly over time, that water will work its way down until it hits an impermeable layer, uh, which is clay or wilden group or any, or any other sort of impermeable feature. Uh, and it will push its way through fissures in that impermeable layer um, until it forms a spring, which will feed the chalk stream itself. Uh, and because these, because the, because of the amount of time it takes for the water to, to flow through the rock, uh, these springs might be running uh, for much longer periods of time, up to up to 12 months in really natural and healthy systems. Uh, so the chalk streams have a very varied ecology. Uh, so you get lots of mayflies, uh, banded demoiselle da uh, uh, damselflies, lots of other invertebrates that en enjoy inhabiting them. Uh, water crowfoot is often a, a very sort of notable feature on chalk streams. You might see large mats of this uh, this plant uh, in the river. Um, with lovely, beautiful white flowers sticking out, which are great sources of pollen. The, the plant itself is a uh, is, is is a great habitat for herbivorous invertebrates, and will actually affect when it becomes dense enough. Will actually affect uh, the flow regime of the river very locally, uh, scouring away silt and sand and and and, and exposing gravel for fish. Uh, so there are a variety of other uh, species that inhabit um, chalk streams. You'll get kingfishers that love the clear. Uh, clear water, they can see their fish much easier when they're sitting on their perches. Uh, brown trout, which uh, which unfortunately are struggling in, in the cray itself because of the number of uh, structures that are in the cray. Um, but we're working with partners to deal with some of those structures. Uh, and water voles, again, water voles are, are not on the cray themselves because of the because of human Im impacts. Uh, but you know, with the, with the amount of vegetation that you would find on a chalk stream, water voles would typically be found uh, on thriving on those streams. Uh, yes, yeah, so the chalk, so the one, the, the catchment I'll be talking about um, is the is the River Cray. That's actually part of the Darrington Cray catchment in the southeast of London. Um, it's a very heavily urbanised catchment, uh, which it takes, which covers parts of Brom, the boroughs of Bromley and Bexley. Uh, there's a small tributary called the, the River Shuttle, uh, which is actually more of a clay river. Uh, so it's quite, uh, quite flashy and quite um, steep. Uh, and meets the cray, as you can see, around about Hall Place, around about Bexley. And so the lower part of the cray has features of, of kind of a chalk stream and a, and a clay system as well. Um, and then the river runs uh, and joins the Darrant at Dartford. Uh, and as Jess already said, the, this river is like any other, it's affected by its, its, uh, its geo underlying geology. In this case, you can see the red patch, which is the, 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 the clay in the, in the northwest of the catchment, uh, though uh, we're, and the, and the river is formed when the water per, permeating through the, the green, which is the chalk, hits that clay, can go no further, and then is forced up through fissures to form springs along its, along its length, and that feeds the river. Uh, so the, the start of the river is at Priory Gardens in Orpington. Uh, this is a lovely sort of parkland area with um, some large ponds, um, and unfortunately, but unfortunately this this park has, has dried up on several occasions and, and the upper Darrant has dried up on several occasions over the last decade. Um, this is partly due to over abstraction, um, climate change and changing rainfall patterns. And there are things that we're trying to do with partners to, uh, to mitigate the effects of, of over abstraction and reduce over abstraction in, in the catchment. Uh, that being said, uh, the river is in many areas is very beautiful. It runs through some very lovely parks like Fitzcroy Meadows, Hall Place and Ruxley Gravel Pits. Uh, here the river has a more natural form with lots of vegetation, lots of uh, overhanging trees, lots of uh, damselflies and dragonflies flittering across the water and you'll often see kingfishers. It's a, it's a wonderful place to visit. 
at its lower uh, extent, you see you reach Fitby Sluice, just uh, just northeast of Crayford. Uh, this is actually the, now the tidal limit of the Cray, and that's formed uh, because of the sluice itself. Uh, and eventually, as you follow the Cray further along, you reach Erith Marshes and, and Crayford Marsh and Dartford Marshes. Sorry. Um, and here, the river is uh, is much flatter. It forms a lot of reed beds, and eventually joins the Darrant, which then joins the trip the Thames tributary. Uh, the Thames estuary, sorry, and and forms must, uh, mud flats and, and and fantastic habitat. So yeah, I'll pass it over to to Katty. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, so moving away from the gentle chalk streams um, to a slightly different type of river, the River Belt um, is a river that we find in Kent. Um, so. Just pointed them out earlier, and we can see on the right-hand side there's again a map. Um, the belt is in it's quite a large catchment that is part of the whole Medway catchment in Kent. Um, it covers about 277 square kilometer, um, with an average of 609 millimeters of rainfall. So again, um, not actually that much rain. And you can see, um, hopefully, uh, how it's made up of lots of little tributaries because it is on a clay um, bedrock. So that means we've got heavy clay soils. Um, so Jess has already described that in a bit of detail. But um, for the river, that means it's quite gentle flowing a lot of the time, but can be fairly flashy. And it is actually a site of special scientific interest um, because it's a clay river. Uh, it's in the low weald. Um, so that's um, not that's next to the high weald A O N B, so area of outstanding natural beauty, but it's a beautiful clay landscape. Um, lots of pasture there and some arable um, land use orchards and horticultural land uses as well. Yeah, um, so the low weald is made up by lots of different habitats. So this mosaic of wet habitats um, is really characteristically fed by surface water and rainwater. So unlike the chalk streams that we talked about earlier, um, because of the clay geology, there's no groundwater body here. Um, so we find lots of ponds, woodlands and streams that are all quite wet. Um, so ponds, some of them are man-made, some of them are natural. Um, wet woodlands and wet grasslands are natural habitats that we'd find occurring much more regularly um, naturally, but a lot of them have been drained artificially either for agriculture or for development. To, so to just get rid of all this water that is just sitting on the surface because it can't infiltrate anywhere, people will have dug out ditches in the past um, and that drains the river. Um, drains that wet woodland, wet grassland and feeds it into the main river and that can um, contribute to how flashy that river responds to some extent. Um, so this really dense network of ditches and streams is also characteristic for the belt and all of those come together to form some larger tributaries and they then um, feed into the main river belt and this main river um, is quite gentle flowing and slow um, unless it rains in which case it has quite a flashy response to those rainfall events um, and in the past um, that's actually been dredged for navigation so to make it deeper and kind of make it easier to get around and um, because the flows can be so low and because it, it can be so variable um, and that navigation is quite important because the clays um, always made it quite difficult to work on um, on this landscape and so instead of building lots of roads across the catchment apparently in the past people would travel down the belt um, by boat and then travel down the midway and then go up into the Thames if they wanted to get to London rather than try and actually get across the land um, so that's um, always that that landscape has always influenced how humans um, can use it which is quite exciting today the river is quite impounded and um, so there's lots of stop boats in it that start that hold water back in the summer to um, increase the amount of uh, retention that's there but that's actually not very good for the ecology of the river um, it stops uh, animals from moving back and forth so especially for fish that's not great and the hydromorphology either so those natural processes that we talked about in the last webinar can't happen in the same way because you've got all these barriers in the river um, thinking back higher up in the in the catchment so um, thinking about where the river starts those wet woodlands and wet grasslands they're really important because they actually cover quite a large area and um, what those headwater streams in general ca um, cover quite a large area and what we do there is really important to the overall health of the river so we really want to um, think about um, that mosaic of habitats that connects them um, so coming back to working on that catchment scale is really important um, so those habitats um, have a really um, yeah play an important part in storing that um, that water in this clay landscape and that can contribute to alleviating low flows as well as alleviating the high peak flows that can cause flooding um, and thinking about the what's special um, in the 
No, we build and in the belt, um, there's lots of reasons, but the two sort of focus um, areas that we might want to take are one, um, the history of this landscape and then the environment. And I've talked about the environment a little bit already, but um, in terms of history, the low yield actually used to be a foraging area for pigs back in the 700s. Um, so people would drive their, um, their sows and pigs into this, um, what used to be an oak or mainly oak woodland. And um, so yield actually just means woodland. Um, and they would just feed on acorns um, there and uh, that was the main use of this landscape so it was not inhabited for a really long time because until the late middle ages actually it um, used to be a notorious hiding place for bandits and highwaymen um, so it wouldn't be somewhere where we'd want to go. Um, at some point a really important iron industry developed there so um, part of this uh, in the national context in terms of the um, iron production the low was really important and some of the ponds that we find were actually made as part of that and they were also used for things like um, linen production or brick laying so um, a lot of bricks were made from the wheel and clay um, and a lot of the little streams that we find were, um, were powering mills as well so there was quite a lot of industry at some point um, and actually even William the Conqueror might have visited it at some point on his way to Hastings although um, I'm not gonna vouch for that personally I have to say. Um, in terms of the environment, I've already mentioned that it's a triplet eye, so a site of special scientific interest. Um, that's because it's a clay river. Clay rivers are usually found in central England um, and often there they are impounded already. So the belt is actually in a reasonably good condition for a clay river or for a lowland clay river. Um, it's got that characteristic gentle flow, but um, with flashy episodes in it. Um, lots of those small streams, ditches and ponds that connected and that make up that freshwater habitat. Um, and then uh, in terms of the wildlife, we find two nationally scarce uh, invertebrates. Um, one of them is on a picture on the right hand side here on the slide, um, which is a nationally scarce water beetle. Um, but we also find the amazingly named hairy dragonfly. Um, there's also lots of river and emerging plants and one example is the yellow water lily that we also see in a picture here and um, that uh, photo that we've got of the river there that's taken from a bridge in Smarden um, so you see all the little um, lily pads covering the river um, so much more pond like so that's due to it, it being su such a gentle flow. Um, so that is a really characteristic clay river flora um, so there's water lilies and then other things like purple loose drive and um, blue water speedwell and lots of others make it quite a special um, environment. Unfortunately it's not in good condition at the moment because of the human impacts of those stop boards and the dredging and um, the impoundment it means it's not connected to its floodplains anymore and things like that and um, there's lots of pollution from agriculture as well as sewage um, and low flows contribute to that because it means that um, the water can't dilute those pollutants as much um, and that's all things that we, we are working on to improve and, and help the river get healthier. Um, so we've talked about those flashy flows and David earlier mentioned the peaks and troughs not existing so much in chalk streams. Well if you look at the flow rates in the belt then we can see um, that that is quite peaky um, so that flashiness is really characteristic for clay rivers and that has an impact on humans um, in terms of our use of the river for two reasons. Um, one is the high flows that we see in the winter. So this February, um, as we all know, has been a really good example of how high those high flows can really get. Um, so that immediate response to rainfall um, going up really, really quickly, but then not staying for very long. Um, so that's why we see the second um, extreme, which is the low flows. So over the summer, um, we actually have very little water left in the river and that's not only an issue for wildlife. So in the last webinar we spoke about um, high flows impacting fish when they can't, um, when they don't have anywhere to escape, but also the low flows impacting when there's not enough um, oxygen or water in the river in general. But that also has an impact on us. Um, so for example, in the belt, the flashy flows contribute to flooding in villages across the catchment. So um, like here, for example, in Yulding, which has been hit by flooding um, quite frequently in the last few years. Um, and so again, this year. The other angle to this is um, that once the belt has joined the River Medway, there's actually an abstraction point at Teeston where um, water for public water supply gets taken out of the river and pumped into this reservoir up in Buell. Um, so Buell Reservoir stores water that is then used by Southern Water and Southeast Water to provide water supply um, to communities across the area. So the impact of low flows in the belt, um, as well as the Medway, of course, um, has an impact as well on how much water we've actually got available for our drinking water. I just mentioned earlier how we're already a water stressed um, area. So it's really important that we manage that in a way that um, supports our, um, our uh, environment because that healthy river isn't important only for the wildlife. It's also important for us to be able to actually turn on our tabs, taps, not tabs. Um, 
So the things that we're doing um, specifically are working across the catchment to look at restoring some of those wet grasslands and wet woodlands that I've already mentioned. Um, it's about introducing natural flood management measures like um, large woody debris in to hold back water and slow the flow down. But it's also about working on soil management and sustainable agricultural practices. And we work with a range of partners on that um, to look after the river and the environment around it. Um, so there's also, there's a triple SI restoration plan that the um, Environment Agency has produced. So there's a pathway for making the belt um, be in favorable condition again um, and be a really healthy environment that can support us um, as well as the wildlife that relies on it. Um, so hopefully that helps understand a little bit about why it's a really special place and why it's worth looking after. And if you do want to visit it, there's lots of footpaths across the Lobiel that are either crossing the river or walk along it for a little while. So it's worth looking out for those. Thanks, Katty. Um, so I'm going to now take you into the centre of our capital. So most people are very familiar with the famous site of the River Thames, but um, people may be less familiar with many of its tributaries. So some of London's rivers are completely hidden. Um, so the fleet runs straight under the very famous Fleet Street, but it's completely covered. Um, and unnoticed by most, the Westbourne flows in a metal tube straight through Sloane Square Underground Station. Um, and this map shows where all of London's hidden rivers are. Um, they're all highlighted with the dark blue dashed lines. And most of these were culverted during the Victorian era um, when rivers of London were treated a bit like open sewers and it was better for them to be um, hidden um, both for people's um, well-being and um, just for amenity. Um, and use of the land. So um, not all of London's rivers have met this sad fate, so we're now going to talk about one um, that's still above ground for us to enjoy, uh, and that's the Beverley Brook down here in southwest London. So the Beverley Brook um, is about 14 kilometres long and it has a much smaller catchment than um, the river belt that Catty just spoke about. It's only 64 kilometres squared. So starting in Worcester Park, the Beverley Brook um, flows northwards, passing through some really key green spaces like Richmond Park and Wimbledon Common, before joining the Thames at Barnes. And the Pill Brook is a tributary of the Beverley Brook. Uh, historically, the Beverley Brook rose from minor springs along the edge of the North Downs, but with increases in groundwater abstraction, these springs no longer exist. Um, and now the brook is entirely disconnected from the chalk aquifer that feeds the neighbouring rivers, the Hogsmill and the Wandle. Uh, so today, most of the flow in the Beverley Brook is maintained um, by a treated sewage effluent that's pumped in from the Hogsmill Sewage Treatment Works in Kingston, um, but also from surface water runoff from the surrounding catchment. So, and it's thought that um, Beverley probably comes from Beaver's Lay, which means that um, many years ago there was probably plenty of beavers living uh, in the Beverley Brook but nowadays unfortunately that's that's not the case we don't see those see them anymore um, and the river is what we call heavily modified which I think the next slides will give you an indication as to why that is. So the Beverley Brook is actually one of the least known um, tributaries of the Thames in London and this is because although it's mostly above ground it's hidden along much of its length uh, and its tributary, the Pill Brook, is in a similar state. So for the first half of its length, you can really only catch glimpses of it as it passes under roads or ducks under car parks. Uh, and it's basically trapped in this concrete channel behind people's gardens. Um, but, and when a channel has been altered like this and reshaped from its natural course, we call these rivers highly modified. Uh, and the Beverly Brook is certainly that. So with part, this part of the channel, uh, being so difficult to access, it means that some stretches are a bit, a bit, bit out of sight, out of mind, and the urban nature of the surrounding land in the upper catchment, as well as the treated sewage effluent um, feeding into the river at its source, means that the Beverley Brook does suffer with some serious uh, water quality problems. Um, but we'll talk about these problems in uh, more detail in another webinar, along with what we're doing um, to give the, the Beverley Brook a bit of TLC. So. Most rivers in London uh, have a setup where the further away from the Thames you are, so the further upstream in the river, the greener, the more rural or suburban the catchment becomes, the more green spaces there are. However, the Beverley Brook is the complete opposite to this, um, and the lower half of the catchment um, runs through some really spectacular urban oases, so Wimbledon Common, Richmond Park, 
um, Barnes Common and Putney Common are some of the um, wonderful areas that it flows through. And a lot of these are highly protected green spaces. But despite that, um, even these less urban feeling areas um, have um, a lot of the river has been straightened, widened and deepened artificially. Um, and it used because it used to be thought that by doing this and moving the water downstream as quickly as possible, we were um, improving flood risk. Um, however, that's since been found not to be the case. Um, and we've carried out a lot of work through Richmond Park and Wimbledon Common in recent years to try and reverse that and uh, restore the natural processes that would normally be happening in the river. So you can see in this photo on the left, before the restoration work, the channel was very straight, very uniform, um, not a lot of variety of habitats going on. Um, but in uh, two years, you see a massive change. There's faster flowing bits, slower flowing bits, some lovely marginal vegetation and things like that. So although the Beverly Brook is highly mod modified and not in a brilliant state, there's definitely a lot of potential here um, for it to be a, a wonderful, healthy river. Um, so remember, if you've got any questions um, after this introduction to three of our rivers, obviously there are a lot more, but hopefully this gives you an idea of um, some of the range of different habitats that we're looking after. And if you want to know more about them, um, please type your questions in below. Um, also, any other questions you've got, because if you've got enough, then maybe we can do a specific um, Q&A session in the future with specific staff members. Um, and also it'll just help us know a bit more about what we might want to focus on in future webinars. So that'd be really useful. Um, next time specifically, um, we will look at what healthy rivers do for us. Um, so there's hopefully a lot that you know already, but um, if not, uh, we'll be telling you about some of the amazing benefits that healthy rivers can bring to everyone's lives. And hopefully you've enjoyed this um, second instalment of our story of rivers and we'll see you again for the third one soon. Um, thanks for tuning in. <laughs>